Sitting Yasam to Toja, who dear yet next to Priyashu, Badrishu, Nityam, Hagata Savia, Bagatir to Mashoki, Bakti, Bhavati, Nightstiki. Nigama come with the Garam Padam to Shukamukadamita, Dravi Samitam, Pibata, Bagatam, La Samaria, Mohoda, Holy Seek, Pubi, Bakti, Bhavati, Nightstiki, Krishna Swadam, Pagate, Damagini, He Kalona, Stadu, Samasha, Paranako, to know Ditaham. Hey Krishna, Karuna, Sindhu, Dino, Bandhu, Jagadpate, Gopisha, Gopika, Kantara, the Kantana Mosh, Dute, Jayatam, Soruto, Pango, Mama Manir, Matergati, Matsara, Shupadam, Boja, Radha, Namad, Namohano, Sri Man, Rasa, Rasa, Rambi, Vamsi, Vada, Karsan, Venner, Shanoga, Gopanata, Sri Ashinaham, Divyad, Brindaranya, Kapa, Drumada, Sri Mad, Radha, Gada, Sri Mishanishto, Sri Si, Radha, Sri Dagovinda, Prasta, Labi, He, Seva, Malish, Manami, Maom, Vishnu, Padaya, Krishna, Vasnaya, Bhutare, Sri Mati, Bhakti, Vedanta, Shami, Tanamani, Maste, Sarasati, Devi, Odawani, Pachani, Nirvishe, Sanyohi, Praskada, Desa, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Shiva Siddhi Go Bhakta Vrindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Good morning, it's Wisdom Wednesday. And uh, yesterday we talked about how in order to try to deflect or discourage Krishna from stealing the butter and the yogurt, the... Uh, Cowherd ladies did two things. One is they suspended those items in pots high above what they thought of would have been the reach of the boys. And the second is they um, put the commodities in dark rooms, figuring that Krishna wouldn't be able to discern as easily in the dark, and that would inhibit uh, the, the thievery. But didn't work that way. Initially, the gopis came to Mother Yashoda and they complained that even though there's no illumination within these rooms, Krishna's jewelry lights up the place like bright daylight whenever he comes in. And Mother Yashoda says, all right, I'll take Krishna's jewelry off. And then the gopi said, no, 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 no. Actually, Krishna's jewelry doesn't light up the room as much as Krishna's form lights up the room. And in fact, the jewelry is not as much an ornament for Krishna as Krishna is an ornament for the jewelry, so please don't take the jewelry off. That brings us to the title of our discussion today, which is that Krishna is the ornament of all ornaments. In the third canto of the Bhagavatam, we find this verse, Yan Marta Lila Payakam Shoyogam, Mayam Balam Darshanaya Tagrihitam, Vishampanam Sasha Chashobhagandage, Param Param Bhushana Bhushanagadam. Bhushana means ornament. So the term Bhushana Bhushana Agaram means Krishna is the ornament of all ornaments. There's no diamond, there's no sapphire, there's no emerald that can enhance the beauty of Krishna's body. Rather, it's just the opposite. It's the beauty of Krishna's body which enhances the jewelry. Normally, it's exactly the opposite way. In this material world, our bodies are even the bodies of females whom we consider great beauties, the body's dull, the body's fleshy, body doesn't have any real inner luminosity on this earthly plane. And so um, if you if you see even a beautiful woman without makeup, without jewelry, without all the mascara and so on and so forth, she can appear quite plain. Therefore, it's very important for women to make themselves up in the morning. I read somewhere a statistic that a man takes less than five minutes to get himself ready, he brushes his hair, he brushes his teeth. He maybe takes a breath mint, um, I don't know, washes his face, uh, puts some maybe some cream on, takes him just a couple of minutes to get ready to go out the door and face the world. It takes a woman between 15 minutes and a half an hour, and she uses 12 to 15 different beauty products. So it's the, through the use of makeup, jewelry, embellishment, earrings, bangles, like necklaces, bracelets, that women present them their best foot forward, so to speak. What to speak of, we won't even go into the cosmetics, surgeries, and things like that. But in Krishna's case, it's just the opposite. It's exactly topsy-turvy. It's not the ornaments, the mascara, 
the bangles, the bracelets, the necklace, the flower garlands that show Krishna's beauty to best light. It's Krishna's beauty that shows all the ornaments of abhankara, it's the Sanskrit word, shows them in the best light. And in fact, of all, there are many demigods, many demigods, literally millions of demigods who are in charge of managing each and every universe. They live on the higher planets. They live hundreds of thousands of years. So you can imagine someone who lives 100,000 years, how even though they've got a material body, essentially they've got a body made of earth, air, fire, water, and mind, intelligent, false ego. I've always says Zoom, not Facebook. I have no idea what that means. Zoom, not Facebook. Zoom, not Facebook. I have no idea what that means. So um, where were we? Where were we? You can see what a profoundly <laughs> distracting influence my powerful wife can have on my fragile mind. <laughs> and she's never clear. She never says anything clearly. It's always like cryptic, you know. I've, I've completely forgotten the train of my thoughts, to be honest with you. Um, oh, yeah, the demigods. The demigods, um, they have material bodies made of earth, wire, earth, water, fire, air. I'm going to just put this out of sight for now. Um, but but we can we can infer that if their lifespans are for hundreds of thousands of years, the, the nature of their material bodies is much more subtle, sublime, and refined than ours. It's not that they don't die. They also come to the point at the end of their life. Says Lord Brahma, by our calculation, he lives for 311 trillion years. But by his calculation, there's for 100 years, like everybody else. But imagine, relatively speaking, a demigod body that can live for 10, 20, 30,000 years more. It's going to be, it's going to be much more beautiful much more attractive, much more subtle, much more sublime, much more sophisticated than these gross bodies. And, and, the, and the wives of the demigods, the heavenly society girls are literally hundreds of times beautiful than most beautiful girls in this material world. And yet, and yet the beauty of Vishnu, the beauty of Vishnu puts the beauty of the demigods to shame beauty of Lakshmi, Vishnu, Narayan, goddess of fortune. The, the beauty of the damsels of Vaikuntha planets puts the beauty of the demigods to shame. Just like the beauty of the demigods puts our earthly beauties to shame, the beauty of the damsels of the Vaikuntha planets, which is like Dwarka Leela, put to shame the beauty of the demigoddesses of the heavenly planet. But above the Bekunta planets is Goloka Vrindavan, where Krishna eternally resides. Yam Shayam Shunamachintam Gunusharupam. He stands in his threefold bending form, a, quiz, a quizzical smile on his lips, with his, his smile on his face, with his feud on his lips, flute on his lips, peacock feather in his mukhat in his crown. And it is said that that beauty of Krishna, that beauty of the two arm form of Krishna, puts the beauty of Lakshmi Narayan to shame. Just like Lakshmi Narayan put the beauty of the demigods to shame, the demigods put the beauty of the demigods to shame. The, the super most sweetness, sweetest, most beautiful form is the form of Krishna. And that's what this is mentioning here. That um, the human beings aspire, they pray for, they worship, they engage in elaborate pujas to see the demigods or to get the favor of the demigods. And the demigods are just praying to get the favor of Vishnu. Vishnu himself, who is the source of millions of Brahmas, millions of Shivas, millions and millions of demigods, Vishnu himself is praying to get a glance of two-armed Krishna from the Goloka Vrindavan planet. In fact, when Krishna was on the planet, there was a pastime where 
the sons of Sandipani Muni. I believe it was Sandipani Muni. His sons had gone to the abode of Yama prematurely in those days. Children never passed away before their parents, but for some reason, the children, I believe, Sandipani Muni passed away. They went to, they went away. <clears throat> Everybody assumed they'd gone to the abode of Yamaraj, which is highly unusual because in those days, the children never passed away before the, the parents. But nevertheless, they disappeared, they passed away, and they, everyone assumed they'd gone to the abode of Yamaraj. So when Krishna finished his education in the gurukul of his teacher, Sandipani Muni, generally speaking, the student offers some gift to, this, to the teacher. So the teacher indicated that as a gift for having educated Krishna and Balram, he wanted his sons back. Krishna agreed to do that. He agreed to bring his departed sons back. But they were not at the abode of Yamaraj. They'd been taken to a special place. Krishna determined that it was none other than Vishnu himself who had stolen the sons of Sandipani Muni. Why had he done that? Why had he heartbroken the teacher of Krishna by taking away his sons prematurely and denying him the, the pleasure of seeing them grow up? The answer is that Vishnu, Narayan, he wanted to see Krishna. He didn't want to miss the chance that during the time that Krishna, from the planet Goloka Vrindavan, which is abo above all the Vaikuntha planets, all the Vishnu, all the Narayan planets, that from the highest planet in the spiritual world, Krishna in his original form came down and he was exhibiting his pastimes as a child in Vrindavan. But Lord Vishnu didn't want to have that, that time period come and go and not be able to see Krishna and, and, and to receive him hospitality. Vishnu wanted to serve Krishna. He wanted to um, welcome him at his own domicile and residence. And so to that end, Lord Vishnu had stolen away the sons of the of the Brahmin Sandipani Muni, which indicates the truth of this verse, which says, Param Param Bhushana Bhushana Garam. That if the demigods are ornaments compared to the earthlings and the various Vishnu incarnations or ornaments compared to the demigods, and Krishna is the ornament of all the demigods. He's the origin of all Vishnu expansions. We get a lot of college students visiting here. Right now we're in the middle of a wave of visitations by students of Alonzo Gasco, who's a very wonderful friend of ours, teacher of world religions over at BYU. So every semester they study Hinduism and a lot of his students end up at our Sunday program. And those who have studied Hinduism in a world religions course almost cross the boards believe that Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu. I don't know where that crept in because scripturally speaking, millions of Vishnus, millions of Shivas, millions of Brahmas come from Krishna. Krishna produces unlimitedly. And yet, however many Shivas you have, however many Vishnus you have, how many Brahmas you have, none of them can produce a single Krishna. Krishna is that in Krishna lies the concentration of all potencies. From Krishna, you get Vishnu. And having emanated from Krishna, it can, it's true to say that Vishnu is God. He's just as powerful as Krishna, except, except insofar as Krishna has the edge in beauty, and Krishna has the edge in sweetness. You could say that Vishnu is 98% Krishna. Shiva is 97% Krishna. Brahma is in a different category. He's an ordinary living entity like you or me who has been promoted to that position. Therefore, Lord Vishnu, if, if, Krishna, if Vishnu is the source of Krishna, then why would Vishnu go to all the trouble of stealing the sons of the Brahman and drawing Krishna to him. This incident puts a lie to what's generally taught in academia, that Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu. And even if Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu, I mean, even if, if for argument's sake, you grant that Krishna ascent, descends through Vishnu, he descends through Vishnu, 
to appear on Earth 5,300 years ago and enact his pastimes. Um, that still doesn't mean that Krishna is higher, that Vishnu is higher than Krishna. And I'll tell you why. I'll give you an example. Let's say the president of the United States decides to come to visit Utah. If the president is a Republican and the governor of Utah is a Republican, the president will be very scrupulous to come into Utah at the invitation of the governor. He wants to prop up the local representative of his political party. And so he won't, he won't um, insult the governor by just flying in without having first received an invitation and allowed the governor the opportunity to welcome him. The governor needs to be able to say, it's because of me that the president is coming to visit Utah. The president can't disregard the governor if they're of the same political party. So similarly, even if you say for argument's sake that Krishna is coming through Vishnu, just like the president may be coming through the governor, but that doesn't mean to say that the governor is greater than the president. The president may have all sorts of flattering words to say about the governor, what a great guy he is, how he's all powerful in the state, how Utah is number one amongst all the other states, this, that, and the other thing. And, and those words are coming out of the president's mouth. He's glorifying the governor. And a less intelligent, more naive person might think, oh, the president is glorifying the governor, so the governor is greater than the president. And that's just etiquette. That's just protocol. That's all, because they're of the same political party. So similarly, even if you do say, for argument's sake, that Krishna descends through Vishnu, it still doesn't mean that Krishna isn't himself the source of Vishnu. Just like the president may come to Utah through the invitation of the governor, but he's still much more than the governor. So Krishna, in fact, is a source of millions of Vishnus and not the opposite way around. Now, another term that we talked about the other day is Shakshana Paramatmane. This is one another verse we find in the third chapter, eighth canto of the Bhagavatam. Shakshana Paramatma, Shakshana means a witness. And Paramatma refers to the indwelling personality of Godhead who is in the heart of all living beings. If someone in this material world does anything. There are multiple witnesses. What's the definition of an ignorant person? An ignorant person goes into the shopping mall. They look around. They don't see any other person in the area. So they think in their foolishness that there are no witnesses. They shoplift, they take something, they put it in their pocket, or they put it in their bag, because there's no other person in the area. That's their foolishness. We know there are any number of cameras. You you can't see, you can't see who who or what is witnessing you. They they're witnessing you, but you're not witnessing them. That's 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 the subtle, that's the sophistication of modern day security techniques. They're seeing you, but you can't see them. So it's a foolish person who goes into a shopping mall and thinks that they're not being observed. That everybody's being observed practically everywhere you go now. There are these CCTV cameras. Almost er most crimes are solved because there's very little that goes unrecorded and unreserved. We recently got a, gra a grant from Home Security for Spanish Fork in Salt Lake City. We applied for and received $150,000 for Spanish Fork and $150,000 for Salt Lake City. And we've been working on it for the last year or so. You spend the money yourself up front and then you get it reimbursed. So now both Salt Lake City and Spanish Fork, there isn't a single place on either property where one can walk and not be observed. And if it, if you're not observed in real time, there are recordings made that can be replayed. So any crime um, will be recorded and that person will be on tape. So this, if this is true, even in our crude, relatively uncultured, sophisticated human society, imagine how much more true it is in God's system. God doesn't just have one or two 
witnesses for every one of your actions. He has 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, there are 13 witnesses to everything that we do. If it, it works in your favor, if you're doing right actions, if you're picking up trash, if you're putting the shopping cart back where it belongs, if you're speaking good, you're speaking about a person who's not present, but you're speaking well of them, you're speaking encouraging words about them, not taking the opportunity to run them down or gossip them. Um, these, these good activities are also witness. Not, it's not just a negative thing, but it's a positive thing as well. Uh, and, and every moment of every day is being noted. So there's no such thing as a small, insignificant part of your day. We make any number of decisions during the course of an, an average day, and every one of those decisions is witnessed and noted down. So any anyone who says, I'm bored, um, um, I don't have anything to do, um, I need some excitement in my life. Just remember that every single moment you're being witnessed. So take the opportunity to pick up your Joppa beats. God sees you. Take the opportunity to call another devotee on the phone and ask them how they are to encourage them. Take the opportunity to go and pull some weeds out of the garden. It doesn't matter whether anyone sees you or not. God sees you. You know, check the oil. Devotees, devotee complexes are notorious everyone drives the car no one checks the oil no one checks the oil yeah i i, I i'll tell you I'll, I'll tell you 50 krishna temples in the united states no one checks the oil everyone drives the car but no one checks the oil you know we had a car a few years ago an indian boy called me oh the car stopped wouldn't go anymore i said i said did you check the oil? Well, how do you do that? So I said, I said, you drove cars in India. Didn't you ever check the oil? He said, I already had, I had servants do that for me. Car was destroyed. The engine burned up because he'd, he'd been driving for six months and he never once checked the oil. So, you know, there are dozens of these opportunities during the course of it. There is no such thing as an average day. I was going to say an average day. Every day is extraordinary. Every day presents multiple opportunities to do what others are not willing to do. You know, there, there's this attitude, I'm, I'm a member of the temple, I'm a member of a community, so life is easy, life is stress-free, I don't have to pay insurance, I don't have to buy, I don't have to pay for a mortgage, I don't have to go to work, so I'll just sit back, you know, not worry about the little things. But that's, that's, Devotional life, community life is meant for just the opposite, assuming responsibilities. And in any community, even a Krishna conscious community, most people won't do the little things. They just won't. They'll just walk past and not do them. And so that's a golden opportunity. That's a golden opportunity. The fact is that in any community, 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. So there's, there's an opportunity. Someone says, well, true, what does it matter? We're all going back to home, back to God. Well, that may be true. But imagine getting back to home, back to Godhead, and Krishna saying to one devotee, yeah, you did good. And then another devotee, yeah, it was all right. And then to another devotee, congratulations, you made it. We're glad to have you back. And then another devotee comes and says, Krishna says, oh, my gosh. I'm so happy to have you back. You went above and beyond. You went the extra mile. You exemplify the spirit of devotion. You represent me. You thrill my heart to a degree that none others do. And the Lord actually steps forward and embraces you amongst all the others. Imagine that. We're all kids. We all had the experience. At the end of the Little League game, the coach says, Jim, good game. You, he might have struck out once and singled once, made one error, but the coach wants to encourage his good game. He says, Charlie, good game. Charlie made a couple of throwing errors. He got a walk. He made one run. Uh, but then for Jim, coach says, Jim got three hits, 
He hustled around the bases. He he encouraged his teammate. He kept up chatter, fire in there, hum hard, hum hard, way to go, guys. He stretched him out. He stretched himself out to catch a fly ball. He he went into the dirt multiple times. And the coach says, Jim, good game. My man, my man. So yeah, you can rationalize. You can say, oh yeah, we're we're all in the we're all in the, the cruise ship back to home, back to Godhead. Doesn't matter that we extend ourselves or go the extra mile. But I, I'm saying to you tonight, it does matter because Krishna is a witness. There are thir- actually there are 13 witnesses aside from Krishna. Aside from the Paramatma within the heart, there's the sun witness, the moon witness. There's earth as a witness. There's air witness. There's the moon as a witness. The air is circulating throughout your body. There's never any part. That's how we speak. We're speaking because of air. Um, we're hearing because of the movement of air. We're, we're digesting our food. We're evacuating the unwanted septic uh, byproducts of our food and drink because of the circulation of air. We're releasing gas, especially babies. You know, they get all uncomfortable they have to be burped to release that so air is a witness it's going through every part of our body and it it takes note it observes everything that's going on in the body of course the sun the wind um, all these are like cctv cameras if one camera fails there's still 12 other cameras recording and if all of these cameras fail or rather let's put it this way Above and beyond all of the demigods who are witnessing all of our activities, the sun, the moon, the air, the fire, the water, there is the Lord who is in the heart closer than a brother. So even if you overlook all of the demigods, if you concentrate and worship the Supreme Lord who resides within your heart, you're not the loser. Krishna will take care of you. Uh, Gajendra was living on the heavenly planets. He was living in the same suburb as the demigods were living in. He was on a first name basis with Indra, the god of rain, with Varuna, the god of in charge of the ocean tides, with Chandra, the god of the moon, he, with Agni, the god of fire. And yet when the crocodile latched upon the elephant's leg, none of the demigods could do anything to help him out. And that was okay because... Gajendra knew that if Krishna or God is for me, who can be against me? God and I are a majority. So he called out exclusively, bypassing, ignoring the demigods. The demigods, one or two of them offered to give him assistance, but he brushed them aside, recalling the fact that he had been a devotee of Krishna in his previous life, and he recalled his prayers from a previous life and he exclusively focused on Krishna, bypassing all the demigods, not concerning himself with the 13 different witnesses, each and every one of whom is a demigod. He simply applied himself. He called himself out to the super soul. And he was saying, you are the ornament of all ornaments. You are the god of all gods. You are the controller of all controllers. You're the enjoyer of all enjoyments. You are the most beautiful living being amongst the most beautiful living beings. And, and, and the reason I can call out to you in confidence is that you're right there. You're accompanying me in the region of the heart. You know what I'm thinking. We may say one thing, but be thinking another things. We may present ourselves publicly in, in one way, but in our heart, we're thinking something quite different. This is called hypocrisy. This is called pretense. This is called role play. It's epidemic in this modern age of Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. But you can't fool the Lord. You can't fool the Lord. Even the witnesses they, they may see you going about your business, chanting, offering prasadam, pl playing the role of a good fixed up devotee, but only Krishna knows the innermost state of your heart. And so Gajendra is saying to Krishna in his, uh, in his extremity here, in his extremely dangerous situation, Krishna, 
please take note of my heart. And if you determine that I'm sincere, that I'm not pretending, that I'm not a hypocrite, that I'm not just saying some words to get to use you for my purposes, that I'm not just vibrating some sound um, out of some mercantile motive to mold you to my desires, to subordinate you to my egotistical desires. You know, Lord, being situated within my heart, that I'm not just crying crocodile tears. My tears are genuine. My stress is genuine. My prayers are genuine. My heart is genuinely calling out to you in helplessness. I'm not just making a show, which unfortunately is more the norm than the exception. Most people, it's sad to say, there's an element of showmanship, of show bodilism to their religious performances, to their chanting of prayers, to their hymns, to their church going. Uh, even, even I, re I remember one time we had an Indian family visiting the temple and I was singing a little bhajan for their pleasure. And uh, the man, while I was, while I was I, singing the bhajan, he went to put a $10 bill in the donation box. But but I happened to look down. I happened to look away. So he knew he, he could see that I wasn't looking. And so he hesitated to take. He kind of took the, the bill out of the donation box. And then when I looked over, he put it in, which I mean, it's it's fine. I mean, it's OK. But I'm, I'm this, you know, this just comes to mind as an illustration of how, you know, we we want to be recognized we want to be known we, we want others to to register the prayers the attendance the money that we give when in fact the important thing is to please god and it really doesn't matter whether others are pleased or not it really doesn't matter whether others noticed or not uh, what matters is that you're doing this for krishna above and beyond any show bodilism or pretense you genuinely from the core of your heart want to please Krishna because he is the ultimate witness. He needs to verify at the end of the day, he needs to make the determination. Are you just making a show with your tongue, a show with your devotion? Are you just making a show of thinking me, a show of making prayers, or are you sincere? And Gajendra is saying to the Lord, he's saying, Lord, I believe I'm sincere. I believe I'm sincere. I'm, I've been fighting this crocodile for a thousand years. And I've come to the end of my rope long since. Now my dependence is entirely shifted to you. Whatever illusory dependence I had or faith I had in my elephant's body, in my place of residence, in my strength, in my power, in my associates, it is long since gone. And I am completely dependent upon you in a state of utter helplessness. I don't need Vayu to intercede for me. I don't need the air. I don't need fire. I don't need the moon. I don't need the sun. I don't need any of them to testify or to witness uh, on my behalf. I just need you. Because you are the param param bhushana. You are the ornament of all ornaments, the controller of all controllers, the Lord of all lords. So please, Lord, reciprocate with me. Reveal yourself to me and come into this equation. Whether you save me or not, whether you save my physical body or not, that's not the point right now. I want pure devotion to blossom within my heart. I heard a story that in India, when you were a school child, elementary level, you could go to the cellar, you could go to the little shop there along the street, and the shopkeeper would have very cheap pens. He would have pens for two rupees, two rupees is like it's 80 rupees a dollar. So I don't know, two rupees is probably, I don't know, half a cent or something. So you could buy a pen for two rupees. Now, if you paid one more rupee, if you paid three rupees, you could actually buy a pen that had a little bit of 
fragrance in it. And if you buy it another rupee, you could buy a pen with some fragrance and you could buy a pen um, which, which would be different colors. So the shopkeeper, he would see you coming in, whether you were a little a school child or whether you were an adult, and he would determine your purchasing power. And then he would bring out the items, which in his estimation, you could afford. For the kids, he'd bring out the one, two, three rupees print. But if it was a businessman, well-dressed with an expensive suit, the shopkeeper would make a judgment and he would bring out a Parker pen, which would cost 150 rupees. Now, the, the shopkeeper is not partial. He's not making judgments. He may, he, may, he may be estimating the purchasing power of his customers, but he's not judging them. He's not determining the course of the transaction. Uh, he's simply reciprocating with the people according to their ability to purchase. So similarly, Gajendra knows that the Lord rewards those who surrender unto them accordingly. If you surrender 2%, the Lord will reciprocate with you 2%. If you surrender 10%, the Lord will reciprocate with you 10%. If you reciprocate 100%, the Lord will reciprocate 100%. So Gajendra is saying, you know, Lord, more so than any of the demigods, you know whether I'm a 2% devotee or a 10% devotee or a 50% devotee or a 100% devotee. I think I'm a 100% devotee. I think that I've gotten to that point because of this life or death situation, which you have precipitated. I see now you, Lord, as the crocodile. When this whole incident started, I saw the crocodile as my enemy. I saw the crocodile coming to take away all the things that I valued. My position, my family, my wives, my kids. I saw the crocodile's cruel death. Anathema, my nemesis. But thanks to you, Lord, now I see that you are the crocodile. Crocodile is time, and time approaches all of us. Time clamps its jaws on each and every one of us. The demigods live for hundreds of thousands of years, and we live for just a short period of time. There is a purpose behind the brevity of our lifespan. The purpose is that we don't waste time. We haven't got a lot of it. And we need to use time to make a decision, to make a commitment to the Lord, to put him in the center of our lives, to orient and gravitate our decisions, our food, our friends, the books we read, the DVDs we watch, the TV shows we see. We need to make the Lord the uh, filter through which we make all of our life decisions, big and small. And because we don't have much time, the, fa the paucity of time indicates that we need to get serious about it. And I talked uh, last week about searchers. People are professional searchers. You know, they just go here and there and here and there and ask questions, not, not in an attitude of sincere inquiry, not really wanting their search to end, but really posturing, really posing themselves as tailoring their questions so that people would be impressed with their knowledge, you see, would be impressed with what they bring to the table. So Gajendra is throwing it to the Lord and he's saying, Lord, you know, you're like the shopkeeper. You're not partial. You give a two rupee pen to someone that has two rupees. You give a 150 rupee pen to someone that has 150 rupees. Someone else might come and have the buying power to make an offer for the whole shop. Someone might come in and say, I'll buy your whole shop. In a, in a perverted sense, in a perverted sense, maybe this isn't a very good analogy. A few years ago, you know, Elon Musk is obviously very much on people's minds because of the news and everything like that. He, he had a difference with, uh, what was it called? Twitter. He had a difference with Twitter. So he just bought it. He just bought the whole company like that. So once in a while, it's rare. Krishna says, Manushanam because out of millions and millions of men, only one is interested in perfection. 
out of millions and millions of those who are in perfection, there's only one who's actually going to do anything about it. And out of millions and millions of who are endeavoring, there might be one who achieves perfection. So there might be one person who walks through the shopkeeper's door who, can, who has the purchasing power to make the shopkeeper an offer for the whole kit and caboodle. That's the pure devotee. Gajendra is saying, I don't have any, I'm not holding anything back. I'm giving you, Krishna, my words. I'm giving you my wealth. I'm giving you my thoughts. I'm giving you my prayers. There is, there is nothing cohabiting my heart. No alternative motive, no deals to match, no need for pretense, no roles to play. Krishna, you are my master. I'm your servant. I'm here only to obey. Gajendra is fully situated in that unmotivated, uninterrupted conscious. And he says, Krishna, you know whether I'm telling you the truth or not. So now, please, um, now the ball's in your court. We talked yesterday about the big finger and the little finger, right? We're the, what we can do is the little finger. Krishna's mercy is the big finger. So you need two fingers for success. We do what we can do, trying for purity, trying for sincerity, trying to rely upon the Lord in a mood of helplessness, that he is our all in all. He is our provider. He is our protector. He is our shelter. He is our tower. But then, then having done everything we can do, then the next step, the, the, the what does it say? The, the thing that needs to drop is Krishna's mercy. So Gajendra is saying, I've done everything I can do. I've, by your mercy, by your mercy, you can't see the sun be, save and except for the fact that the sun is in your eye already. You can't speak, save and except for the fact that Agni, the god of fire, is in your throat, that when your vocal cords rub against each other, there's that element of fire by which you can produce sound. The moon controls the mind. So you cannot, you cannot think except for the sanction of the moon. So Gajendra is saying, by your mercy, I'm speaking about you. I've captured you within my mind. I'm seeing you by the grace of the sun. So now it's up to you, Lord. The little finger is there. Now, please send me your mercy. And the mercy is never earned. There's nothing you can do at the end of the day to force Krishna to show his mercy. But because we know he is merciful, that is his most salient quality. Quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath to his mightiest in the mightiest. It behooves the crowned monarch better than his scepter and his sway. God is first and foremost, above and beyond everything else, merciful. Otherwise, None of us should see salvation. None of us should see salvation because none of us deserved it. We came to this material world wanting to separate ourselves from God. So unless he gives us the wherewithal to turn ourselves back into him, uh, we couldn't have done it. So Gajendra says, due to your mercy, my speaking is pure, my seeing is pure, my thinking is pure, Everything is lined up, what I can do. And, 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 and I'm also not taking credit. I'm saying that none of this could have happened except you hadn't sanctioned it. And because you sanctioned it, because you, you allowed me to line up everything properly, now I, I'm so hopeful. I know, on the one hand, that nothing I did earned your grace, but I can understand that you have... You've, you're starting to break through. The sun is starting to break through the clouds. There's nothing I can do to make force the sun to break through the clouds. But I can see now that you're, you, you've, you've done this, that, and the other thing. And everything's set. Stage is set. So I'm waiting with bated breath. I know, 
I know that you're not forced. You're not obliged. You're the Lord of all lords. You're the Lord that Vishnu wanted to see you when you came here. But I'm, re I'm recognizing the signs. I'm recognizing the portents. Your mercy is forthcoming. You can just imagine Gajendra. <laughs> his voice is trembling with ecstasy. The, the bristly hairs on his elephant's body are starting to stand on end. It's getting elephant goosebumps. So this is the situation. This is the drama. This is the suspense. And in fact, but we know in retrospect that uh, Gajendra is not wrong. The Lord's going to appear before him in very, very short order. All right. So thanks very much for being with us here on this Wisdom Wednesday discussion that Krishna is the ornament of all ornaments. Let's review some of the people that jumped on board through Facebook. Brent, Valavachandra, Bhai Bhavi. Bhai Bhavi says, I see other person on Zoom. I see. Yeah, I, 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 guess, I, I guess that's what happens when other people join in Zoom. Okay, I could have. All right. Yeah, there's a setting speaker. I think I had the gallery setting because we had a Zoom meeting last night with members of the Salt Lake City Temple. And the, so I had the setting on gallery. So everybody was seeing your beautiful face there, Kelly, for the duration of it. <laughs> you shared the screen with me. We had the gallery view on there. So now, now I know what Bible is trying to say. Um, Leah, whose birthday was yesterday, says, yes, only Krishna knows our innermost heart and knows the pureness of our devotion. Our poet laureate, Balavachanda, writes, Krishna's beauty illuminates the jewels, but dull material rocks are preferred by rascals and fools. Ornaments separated from their source are lustrous, lusterless and coarse, but when polished with sincerity, their brilliance gives us insight and clarity. Krishna's beauty illuminates the jewels, but dull material rocks are preferred by rascals and fools. Ornaments separated from their source are lusterless and coarse, but when polished with sincerity, their brilliance gives us insight and clarity. And here's another short little ditty here. Don't neglect to change the oil until the car won't start. Krishna knows in sincerity in your heart, do your part. <laughs> All right. We've heard from our Facebook friend. Do you have anything you want to throw in there? Do you want to say anything, Kelly? You'd have to unmute, unmute first. Here's Kelly from Idaho. Uh, thank you, Swami. Okay, that's good. Okay, we'll um, wind it up. Continue this discussion. It's like churning an unlimited ocean. It never ends. There's no beginning, middle, and end. But as best we can, we come to the shore of the ocean. We try and pick up a few grains of sand. So that's what we did today. And we'll be back next week for Motivational Monday. In the meantime, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari.